I'd like to uh, welcome our uh, listeners and viewers again to another of our uh, interview with the experts uh, sessions. I'm delighted to have with us uh, today uh, Dr. Damon Houghton, uh, who's one of our vascular medicine specialists within our Department of Cardiovascular Medicine, uh, who's really an expert uh, in uh, uh, anticoagulation and uh, thrombosis and uh, is heavily involved in research in this area. But today uh, we've uh, asked him to come and uh, talk to us about uh, COVID-19 infections and vaccinations and understanding what the prothrombotic uh, risk is. So uh, uh, really a warm welcome, uh, Damon. Thank you very much. I appreciate the, the opportunity to talk about this. Um, yeah, obviously it's, a, it's been something that uh, has been with us now for the last uh, three years or so. So um, with that in mind, uh, what, what have we learned about the risk of thrombosis associated with uh, COVID-19 infection? Well, I think it's a great question. I think it's really important as we kind of conceptualized what's happened over the past few years. I think as the pandemic started, we were pretty overwhelmed by this concept of thrombosis from the initial reports that were, were coming out in other countries kind of before the big waves hit us in the United States. And really some of those uh, studies were showing really high thrombotic rates, some of them up to 60, 70 percent of, of patients having thrombosis. Uh, and this really set the stage for a lot of concern about about thrombotic events in COVID-19 infected patients. Um, in retrospect, I think we've learned a lot from those initial reports. Um, I think many of those initial reports um, really had somewhat of a, a selection bias in terms of who was in those studies. Many of these were ICU patients. They were in, in some ways the sickest of the sick patients. Uh, many of these studies included screening ultrasounds, um, some classified minor thrombotic events, such as superficial thrombophlebitis into their definitions. Um, and, and many of these came from places in the world where anticoagulation prophylaxis really wasn't a mainstay of, of hospitalized treatment regimens. And so I, I think in looking at some of the initial literature and, and where we've come, it's important to go back and reconsider this concept of really how prothrombotic COVID-19 infection is um, with, with some of the data that's come out more recently. Uh, as the pandemic was starting, um, Dr. Chadhuri and, and I published an article with um, our initial case series review at Mayo Clinic, and this was published in Mayo Clinic Proceedings. And what we looked at is the first 100 patients who are hospitalized with COVID-19 infection in, in our hospitals. Um, and, and quite controversial and, and very interestingly, we found a venous thromboembolic rate of only 2.9%. And so that was in stark contrast to much of what had been published in the previous literature literature in very high risk uh, situations in other countries. And so uh, that was a big component of how we ended up approaching uh, venous thromboembolism and prophylaxis here at Mayo to start with, because we had some good insights into to what we were seeing initially. Um, Subsequently, there's been a lot of additional research uh, in this area. And I think when we look at larger studies um, and, and we look at um, uh, studies that, that include both inpatients and outpatients, we really see a, a very different picture of thrombo thrombotic rates. Uh, clearly, COVID-19 is associated with an elevated thrombotic risk. And, and we've seen this over and over again. The question is, how high is that risk? And, and uh, is that risk um, higher in specific populations in a way that we can use that clinically? And ultimately, this is this is what we've found. Uh, Dr. Pasha and I published a, another paper in thrombosis research looking at uh, over 50,000 patients with COVID-19 infections. And then this topic looked at inpatients and outpatients. And interestingly, we found a rate of VTE about 0.67% in the 90 days after COVID infections. So quite low, especially when you consider some of those initial higher thrombotic rates. This rate has is, is also been confirmed in a, a number of other studies. Uh, there's a study published in Clinical Infectious Disease. Uh, this was a population study out of Denmark, showed a 0.4% risk at 30 days of venous thromboembolism. There was a Kaiser Permanente study in, published in uh, JAMA Internal Medicine that had a 0.8% risk of venous thromboembolism. So what we know is that there are very high-risk patients, but if you look at 
the thrombotic risk in general for all of the patients who are infected, this thrombotic risk is, is really much more reasonable and, and not as severe as, as many of us had assumed when, when we were getting initial reports from, from other countries. So, so, so that's really interesting. If I could just stop you there for a moment. Uh, I mean, those numbers really, I, I mean, really less than 1% is really what you're saying. Absolutely. Uh, with the more recent uh, you know, studies. And so I appreciate you putting that whole thing into really a historical context uh, there. But those low numbers, does that reflect a population that has, uh, has been vaccinated? Um, and now, I mean, early on, we really won't have, didn't really know how to treat COVID-19. And so, uh, again, does yeah, great question. Take those numbers, and then the second thing would be uh, many of these patients you know, were arriving in hospital and then treated with antivirals. So, uh, ha- has that impacted that uh, number? Uh, maybe you can just sort of uh, yeah, great questions. Absolutely. Um, so, most of the data that that I mentioned there was very early on in the pandemic. Um, our particular data was was um, um, uh, quite early, prior to most vaccinations. So, so these are really rates of kind of the first and second waves of the pandemic when when there uh, was uh, little or, or no vaccination in the population. Um, um, as it relates to COVID-19, kind of other treatments, I think that's actually a, a particularly fascinating area. Um, when you look at a number of the other treatments that are out there, remdesivir, for example, dexamethasone, um, uh, other uh, immune modulators that have been used, there really um, uh, was not a significant difference of thrombosis reduction in those trials. So despite some of them being positive and, and showing that there is a mortality benefit from using them, they actually did not seem to reduce the venous thromboembolic rates, which, which I found quite interesting and, and a little bit unexplained. But uh, those drugs didn't seem to have a huge thrombotic risk reduction. And and so far, you've been talking about uh, VT, you know, venous uh, you know, thrombosis. So uh... Uh, arterial thrombosis was was that been associated with uh, COVID infections at all? It has been, and, and there's certainly been numerous case reports. I think that the the data from an epidemiologic standpoint is probably more difficult here, and, and I think that's largely related to the the type and variety of thrombotic events that we see um, in our clinical practice. And in many ways, we saw atypical thromboembolic events um, in our COVID-19 patients. For example, large arterial uh, aortic thrombosis um, and, and some embolization in the lower extremities associated with those. And so, I think that's been a little bit more difficult for us to capture um, in our research topics. But yes, absolutely. Uh, we have seen increased arterial events as well. And, and so recognizing then these very low rates of uh, your thrombosis in, in the real world and uh, when you've analyzed these very large uh, patient uh, populations, um, is there still a role for for hospitalized patients for uh, prophylactic uh, um, anticoagulation that may be beyond what we typically might do for a hospitalized patient with a non-COVID uh, illness. Yes, absolutely. So while the overall risks are quite low, we definitely know that there are pe- populations of patients who are at much higher risk. Um, increasing age, for example, is, is a significant risk factor for, for venous thromboembolism. Hospitalization is a significant risk factor, and, and rates in the hospitalized patients are, of course, much higher than those in the, in the outpatient setting. And so right from the beginning of the pandemic with these reports, um, we knew that prophylactic anticoagulation was important to continue. And for, for the most part, that was that was the practice here in the United States with, with hospitalized patients in general. So that wasn't too different. Um, but what we did start investigating and, and numerous randomized control trials were launched in this setting, uh, we start to ask the question whether we should be doing more than standard dose uh, prophylactic anticoagulation. And so this really took the form of, of two different positions uh, with some folks saying we should you know, increase to perhaps intermediate dose anticoagulation or intermediate um, uh, prophylactic anticoagulation. And another group kind of hypothesized that maybe we needed to go all the way to therapeutic anticoagulation. And so the clinical trials that were designed in this space really kind of went to those two strategies to try to reduce thrombotic rates. The other thing which I think is pretty interesting is that the initial hypotheses here were not only that we could reduce thromboembolic rates, we actually thought that we could significantly 
uh, affect and improve mortality with anticoagulation. And, and some of the hypotheses there were related to this concept of microvascular thrombosis with, with the thought and the assumption that much of the, the comorbidity and, and mortality was associated with this hypercoagulable state in, in a way that was causing organ damage and contributing to, uh, to lung disease um, and hypoxia and, and ultimately mortality. So the, the hypotheses and, and outcomes of these trials were really designed to uh, largely show a survival advantage um, and, and, and look for a mortality improvement uh, with these anticoagulation regimens, in addition to the reduction in venous thromboembolic and arterial thrombotic outcomes. Um, so the, a few different trials were, were launched, and we ended up getting some data initially in the spring of 2021. And this was uh, some first data from the INSPIRATION trial. And this was a trial that looked at that hypothesis of intermediate dose anticoagulation compared to standard prophylactic dose anticoagulation. And ultimately, this was a negative trial. There was not any significant improvement in survival, and there wasn't a clear uh, reduction in, in venous thromboembolism related to uh, the, the higher intermediate dose anticoagulation. A few other studies have examined this as well. There was a study by Dr. Parapu and colleagues, uh, also in a randomized control trial, again, not able to uh, demonstrate an improval in, in survival. Uh, a very recent study, there was an anti-COVID uh, um, study that was recently published, uh, similar results actually, but did show a slight reduction in the uh, venous uh, thromboembolic uh, and, and arterial thrombotic risk reduction. So maybe there's a little bit of role in, in terms of uh, thrombosis prevention, but we're clearly not seeing a survival advantage based on giving these intermediate doses. Um, we then got additional data from some of the other randomized control trials that were looking at therapeutic anticoagulation coagulation, and there are a lot of trials in this space. Uh, the first trial was a trial called the ACTION trial. This was a trial that tried to incorporate uh, rivaroxaban um, into the dosing regimen um, if patients were stable enough for it uh, as the therapeutic option. Ultimately, this trial was negative as well. There was not any survival advantage with the, the use of therapeutic anticoagulation with a component of rivaroxaban compared to the, the standard prophylactic anticoagulation. Um, so this wasn't the end, though. There was a few other trials that came out. There was a rapid trial, what we called the multi-platform trials, and then the HEP COVID trial, all of which were answering uh, similar questions with regards to therapeutic anticoagulation and slicing the populations in a slightly different way. Uh, what we ultimately found in large part through the multi-platform trials is that there probably was some benefit in, in terms of, of uh, mortality improvement and, and reduction of end organ damage by using therapeutic anticoagulation, but it was a very limited subset of the population of COVID-19 patients who were hospitalized. And so what we ended up finding and, and was confirmed in, in these trials is that the sickest of the sick, those folks in the ICU really were not demonstrating any significant benefit to therapeutic anticoagulation. And in fact, we may have been harming them with, with elevated bleeding risk in doing so. Uh, the area that was the most um, beneficial were those patients who were hospitalized um, and were mildly hypoxic. These folks who were on nasal cannula oxygen um, and had an elevated D-dimer, the sort of sweet spot. You had to be just sick enough, but not too sick uh, to, to potentially benefit from therapeutic anticoagulation throughout the hospitalization. And so this is really where, where kind of guidelines ultimately went, is that we should be selecting a subgroup of hospitalized patients those who are at lower bleeding risk, um, those who are hypoxic, but not too hypoxic. And, and we think that the elevated D-dimer um, in that hospitalized setting adds to that, that uh, risk stratification. And so that's, that's where these guidelines have gone for the moment. And, and how typically, I mean, just very briefly, how, how would you treat those patients? What, what, what would be your anticoagulant uh, regimen? Absolutely. So most of the studies that were, were positive here use kind of a combination of heparin or Lovenox. Um, there's been kind of the historical perspective of, of maybe these uh, heparinoid medications having some antithrombotic effects. Um, and, and the fact that the action trial that used rivaroxaban was negative also lended towards kind of that interpretation of, of these positive results. Um, but heparin and, and uh, Lovenox were, were their mainstays of, of anticoagulation in these trials. And the patient who's been hospitalized but is not in the ICU environment, um, you know, maybe they've got some coexistent uh, disease, um, prophylactic anticoagulation for them beyond what we might normally do for a hospitalized patient? 
Uh, so a, a hospitalized patient who is is not on oxygen. Correct. Yeah. So um, and so this is a little bit interesting as well because obviously at, at our hospital we would screen for COVID patients and and many times we would pick up positive. Uh, patients who who weren't particularly symptomatic, weren't on oxygen, perhaps were in the hospital for some other reason. Um, and so, correct, the, the recommendation would be in those folks if prophylactic anticoagulation was, was appropriate given their clinical circumstances, certainly add that on. Um, but uh, this this recommendation wouldn't apply um, to, to those without some hypoxia associated with their condition. Well, unfortunately, we're running out of time, but I, I do think that we should just uh, maybe very briefly in a minute or so just address the uh, the other uh, really interesting uh, observation and obviously worrying, you know, for, you know, I guess it was about two years ago now when uh, recognized that uh, there may be some patients who had uh, a vaccine-induced uh, thrombotic syndrome, uh, the, uh, the vaccine-induced immune a thrombotic thrombocytopenia, which was seen with those, the uh, the adenoviral vector uh, uh, vaccines, um, obviously very very rare. Uh, and maybe, uh, I mean, is it something that we're still going to see in the future? Um, typically, you know, the, the vaccinations now are, are going to be uh, with mRNA uh, vaccines, so. Have you seen a case of that uh, either recently or, or, or previously? And, and what's the current status of, of that? And I don't think we have time to go into all of the understanding of the pathophysiology of that. It's very, very interesting, obviously. But uh, just if you can just, uh, in, in sort of a nutshell, just tell us what is the status of uh, this uh, vaccine uh, immunomediated uh, thrombotic thrombocytopenia? Absolutely. Yeah. So to, to my knowledge, I'm, I'm not aware of a case at Mayo Clinic. And as you mentioned, this is an extremely rare uh, side effect that we've seen with the adenoviral-based uh, vaccines uh, the, in the United States, the Janssen or Johnson & Johnson vaccine, and, and in Europe, the AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, AstraZeneca vaccine might have a slightly higher risk than the, the Janssen vaccine. Uh, it, there have been some studies now that have put this risk into perspective, and, and really, as you mentioned, it is quite rare, about 3.8 uh, per million vaccinated patients. And so this is a, a very rare, and but obviously very concerning um, uh, uh, syndrome that's occurred after this. I think we've understood a lot more in terms of the pathophysiology. Dr. Anand Padmanabhan, and in particular here at Mayo Clinic, is, is a hematologist who's done a lot of research in this area to, to help advance our understanding. Um, but ultimately, this ended up being a very rare side effect. Um, the vaccination pause that the CDC and the FDA did in April of 2021 ultimately was lifted, um, and it was felt to be appropriate to continue vaccinating with, with the uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine, given the overall risk benefit ratio at that time. Uh, ultimately, we have kind of shifted in, um, in large part for, for other reasons as well towards the mRNA-based vaccines. Um, a number of, of research studies have, have sort of subsequently come out that have really tried to demonstrate um, the, the safety of these medications. There had been concerns related, well, maybe there are some other thromboses that aren't vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenic uh, syndrome instances. And, and I think really what we've seen is the research is showing these mRNA vaccines don't cause VIT um, and they don't seem to be associated with any uh, more generalized thrombotic risk. And so I think we really do have a, a very safe uh, vaccine, um, especially as it relates to, to venous thromboembolic events. Um, and if anything, there, there's also some research showing that we probably are actually reducing thrombotic events by influencing um, COVID infection rates as well. Okay, yeah, which gets us back to uh, one of the points and questions you know, earlier in that discussion. So, unfortunately, that's all we have time for uh, today, uh, Damon. So, I uh, really want to thank you for, for sharing your experience. And, and obviously, you know, you've taken a very keen interest in this and have contributed to our understanding of this. And um, and uh, certainly from a personal note, I mean, it's uh, much more reassuring, uh, your know, data uh, and observations um, that we're hearing today, you know, compared to, you know, a couple of years or so ago. Uh, so, it, again, another example of you know, applying sound scientific uh, your approaches to understanding um, not just, I guess, the epidemiology, but you know, the pathophysiology and, and now uh, the, the importance of um, anticoagulation. And, and it seems as though things have sort of been dialed down just a, a little bit. So uh, it, 
you know, bringing clarity to this, I, I think, has been so helpful to, uh, um, I guess, all of us, you know, taking care of these patients or who come across these patients. So, so Dr. Houghton, uh, again, thank you so very much uh, for, for taking the time to be with us. And, um, and again, to our listeners uh, and viewers for, for joining us today. Thank you so much, Dr. Bell.